Now, I'm very pleased to welcome James Swanson to Politics and Prose with his latest history, The Deerfield Massacre. Uh, this book has a special personal connection for me. I grew up in Massachusetts listening to stories from my dad about our ancestors in our family tree traced back to this massacre in Deerfield in 1704. One of my great, 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 great grandmothers, uh, <laughs> thankful Stebbins, she survived the raid and the forced march up to Quebec. Uh, instead of returning, she married into a French family and the rest is history. I'm grateful to James for illuminating this history, but also exploring how the raid itself morphed and changed through the centuries in the minds of the residents of Deerfield, uh, going from a collective trauma uh, into an important shared history. So please join me in welcoming James Swanson to Politics and Bros Bookstore. for that kind introduction. Happy to see some friends in the audience too, including uh, two great authors, Captain Neville and Stashauer, Dan Stashauer, uh, Edgar Award winner, and winner of all kinds of other awards for Captain. Um, I'm happy to be back to Politics and Prose because Politics and Prose has hosted me for every book I've written. And so I feel like I'm coming home to the, the best independent bookstore in America and a, a great treasure in Washington, D.C. And so, I thought I'd talk a little bit about how I got into this and what the book's about in a nutshell. I don't really read much from a book when I speak to an audience because I figure you can do that yourself and I won't bore you by just reading the words. I will read two passages to set the tone of New England because it's so important that we remember that the New England of this story is not the pretty New England of the American Revolution or the early federal period. It was a dark and terrifying time to live in early America. So I'm going to quote two things from the book at some point to, to evoke that. But I thought I'd talk a little bit about how I got to this story. Uh, I was like the, an author's origin story. Uh, I grew up in a family of storytellers. My grandmother worked for the old Chicago newspapers during the last of the Ben Hecht front page era. And she told me wild stories when I was a boy. When I was six years old, she said, Jamie, did you know that during the World's Fair in our city, Chicago, where I grew up, in 1893, a madman doctor murdered a hundred girls and then dissolved their body in acid? I was six years old. And my mother said, uh, he didn't know that until you told him. And then uh, my grandfather was a Chicago policeman from the 1930s to the uh, late 1960s, the civil rights and Vietnam War protest airs. And one time he came home and created in me a never-ending habit. I still get six newspapers a day, the hard copy. He said, don't let Jamie read the newspapers tonight. <laughs> so what did I do, of course, that night? I read the papers, and I, I read the headlines. Madman slaughters nine student nurses in Chicago apartment. Richard Speck, remember that name? The Madman Killer. And then my father went to Lane Tech High School in Chicago where one of the boys who went to that school was Herbert Hans Haupt. And you might remember he was one of the eight Nazi saboteurs landed by U-boat on American shores in 1942. Uh, Herbert, unfortunately uh, for him, was uh, executed, electrocuted, after he was imprisoned in a cell below my office at the Department of Justice. <laughs> and in fact, I took my father to my office uh, one day. I was in, on the fourth floor of the Office of Legal Counsel which is the counsel to the president and the attorney general on constitutional matters. And right outside my office door, there's a big bronze plaque on the wall that said, in this room, by military tribunal, were tried the eight Nazi saboteurs. So I showed my dad uh, his former colleague student's name on that, on, that, on that wall. So I grew up listening to wild stories and wild tales. And so that really got me into so writing. Uh, when I was 10, my grandmother gave me a framed engraving of John Luke's Luke Derringer pistol that he used to assassinate Abraham Lincoln. A bicycle? No. A baseball glove? A mitt? No. Um, an engraving of a murder weapon. And framed with that engraving was part of a clipping from the Chicago Tribune from the morning of uh, April 15, 1865, the morning that Lincoln died. And I remember the headline so well. Because in those days, newspapers didn't have big, bold headlines. They had a series of descending headlines. Booth, the murderer, assassinates the president, leaps to the stage, cries six separate tyrannists, runs to the wings, out the back door, and 
And at that moment, so, someone had cut the clipping off in mid sentence. <laughs> and I remember telling myself, You've got to, I've got to read the rest of the story. I've got to know the rest. I must have read that story a couple hundred times when the print hang, was hanging on my bedroom wall. And much later, when I wrote my book, Manhunt, The 12 Day Chase for Lincoln's Killer, I added to my collection uh, a set of 100 Chicago Tribunes from April, May, and June, 1865. So I had the actual full paper that that clipping represented. So I've, uh, because of these wild stories and the influence of my parents and grandparents, I've grown up loving stories and loving wild tales. I came to the Deerfield book because when I was in college, I spent a summer in Deerfield living in a pre-revolutionary war house. And it was a program, a fellowship program that gave college, six to eight college students a year an opportunity to study early American art, architecture, history, ceramics, material culture, paintings, all the rest. And down the street from where I live was a town cemetery. And in that cemetery, I found two tombstones, one to Eunice Williams and one to Reverend John Williams. The one to Eunice said, this is Eunice Williams, wife and consort of Reverend John Williams. And then her tombstone read, fell by ye rage of the barbarous enemy. And William, John Williams' tombstone, he, he died later, he survived this event by 25 years. His, his tombstone was more placid and it said to, to, to Reverend John Williams, good and faithful pastor of this place. And so my obsession with this story began in the summer of college, junior year, when I learned about the, the Deerfield Massacre, so-called, and I'll explain, was it a massacre or was it not? Was it something else? And uh, so I've been interested in this story for many, many years, and I always wanted to write a book about it, and did. Uh, I'll mention this about Manhunt. I know some of you have read that book. Uh, this Friday, March 15th, uh, Apple TV will prepare will premiere the first two episodes of the Manhunt series. <coughs> and, I, thank you. and I know that Politics and Prose has a su supply of Manhunts, which I'll also be happy to autograph for you. Uh, the series is great. It stars Tobias Menzies from Outlander and The Crown, and Secretary War Stanton. Lily Taylor is Mary Lincoln. Uh, Anthony Boyle, who you might have seen in Masters of the Air, which is on the TV now, plays our John Luke's booth. And one of my favorites, Patton Oswalt, the comedian, plays Lafayette Baker, one of the detectives hunting for Booth. And an actor I love now is Abraham Lincoln, Hamish Linklater. He's a fabulous Abraham Lincoln. I've known a few Lincolns. I knew Gregory Peck, uh, visited him in his home. Uh, now Sam Waterston, who's played Lincoln. And I met Hal Holbrook, who also played Lincoln. And after the first day on the set, we filmed most of it in Savannah. Uh, Hamish and I had dinner that night, and uh, he said, I was very nervous when I knew you were coming, uh, because you're an expert on Lincoln. You know, what if I'm terrible? And I said, I've watched you all day, Hamish, and I must say, you are Abraham Lincoln. He's got the right voice, the right vibe, the right phys physicality of the role. And so uh, Tobias and Hamish do a wonderful job playing the relationship between Lincoln and Stanton, which was one of great affection, admiration. And Lincoln once said, if I didn't have Stan, he's the, he's the rock on which the wave, waves of rebellion crash and are broken. And I could not survive without Stanton. And so the, the assassination of Lincoln really shattered Stanton. So I think a lot of that is, I've seen the series five times now. Uh, first take, second take, final cut. So I, I hope you all like it, and we'll watch it when it comes out uh, this Friday. But back to Deerfield. We forget what a frightening and terrifying place New England was in the late 1600s and early 1700s. And there's just a couple of things I want to read from the book that really evoke that. Uh, one comes from, uh, actually, before King Philip's War, this is when the, the, the colonists first arrived in Massachusetts. And the, the the fear of England, of Indians, of the forest primeval, the darkness, haunted Abraham Lincoln for all of his life. Well, one of his grandfathers was slain by Indians lying in wait while he was tending to his crops. And Lincoln <clears throat> once wrote this. He said, writing to a cousin of his, his grandfather's, quote, death by Indians, and of Uncle Mordecai, 
then 14 years old, killing one of the Indians, is a legend that more strongly than all others is imprinted upon my mind and memory. And one of the witnesses to this attack was Abraham Lincoln's own father, who survived this attack. And so it, it really haunted Lincoln from the beginning. And William Bradford really described the forest and the, the danger of the wilderness in his book on Plymouth Plantation. And he said about the Patriots coming, being thus past the ocean and a sea of troubles before, they had no friends to welcome them, no inns to entertain or refresh their weather-beaten bodies, no houses or much less towns to repair to, to seek for succor. Savage barbarians were ready to fill their sides full of arrows than otherwise, and the season was winter, sharp and violent, and subject to cruel and fierce storms, dangerous to travel to known places, and much more to search an unknown coast. Besides, what could they see but a hideous and desolate wilderness, full of wild beasts and wild men? The summer being done, the whole country full of woods and thickets represented a wild and savage view. If they looked behind them, there was the mighty ocean which they had passed, and was now a main bar and gulf to separate them from all the civil parts of the world. So that's a different place than Revolutionary War America. And then uh, it was a time of great suspicion and fear of witches in later times. And I'll, I'll just mention this, the early historian of Deerfield said this about fear at that time. And this is how people felt at the time of the Deerfield Massacre in 1704. Here's the quote from him. It was the age of superstition. Women were hung for witches in New England and New, and witchcraft was believed in everywhere. Indeed, 12 years before, from February 1692 to 93, a witchcraft hysteria had gripped Salem, Massachusetts. The contagion spread beyond Salem. More than 200 people in Salem had been accused of entertaining Satan. In Salem, 19 people were hanged, 14 women and five men, and one man, Giles Corey, was pressed to death under a board piled with heavy rocks to try to force him to confess to witchcraft. And here's what people in Deerfield believed in the late 1600s at the time of the Deerfield Massacre. Quote, every untoward event was imputed to supernatural causes. Did the butter or soap delay its coming? The churn and kettle were bewitched. Did the chimney refuse to draw? Then witches were blowing down the smoke. Did the loaded cart get stuck in the mud? Invisible hands were holding it fast. Did the cow's milk grow scant? Imps had been sucking her. Did the sick child give an unusual cry? Search was made for the witch's pins with which it was torn. Were its sufferings relieved by death? Glances were cast around to discover the malignant eye that doomed the child. Tales of events like these, so fascinating and so fearful, sent the adults as well as children to bed with blood chilled. Every sense alert was here, ready to see a ghost in every slip of moonshine and trace to malign origin, every sound breaking in the stillness, the rattle of the shutter, the creaking of the door, the moan of the winds, or the cry of the birds and the wild beasts at night. So that's really the New England I'm writing about in this book. So, in a nutshell, Deerfield was the victim of a great war between France and England for control of the North American continent during Queen Anne's War of 1702. It was a war about the Spanish succession, who would be allowed to become the new king of Spain. And that war came across the ocean and came to America. The French were in uh, Canada today, which is then called New France, and the English were in New England, Maine, Connecticut, Vermont, and Massachusetts. Deerfoot was a little town of 300 people on the far northwest corner of Massachusetts. Uh, Canada was closer than New York. And so uh, it was a poor town. It was not like Boston or the other wealthy towns. 300 people who were farmers, tradesmen, workers, carpenters, barrel makers, were eking out a living on the New England frontier. It was a dangerous place for a long time. Ever since King Philip's War, Philip's war in 1675, which almost destroyed half of the New England settlements. There were constant raids. A family might go into the woods and never be seen again. A child might be tending livestock and the child would vanish into the night and no one would ever see them again. There was a constant fear of terror of the Indians. And so in uh, late 1703, rumors came down 
from Canada that the French and Indians might be coming on the way. The French had a number of Indian tribe allies, uh, Mohawk, Huron, Kabnaki, Iroquois, and others. And the French were not the masters of the Indians. The Indians weren't the servants of the French. They were equal partners in the wars against the English. And so the French only had some control or supervision of what the Indians decided they wanted to do. And so then in January 1704, an expedition of more than 300 Indians and French marched 300 miles through snow and ice in the middle of winter and arrived outside of Deerfield. Their plan was multi-part. One, some of the tribes wanted to kill everyone they could in town. Some of the tribes wanted to take captives and adopt them as natives. These were called mourning wars, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, to replace as equal members of the tribe, people who were killed in battle or who died. The French wanted captives that they could ransom to England or tra trade back for captives that the English had taken of, of French people. And so there are multiple motives in this attack. They came by stealth. They crept through town in the middle of the night. It was dark. And the snow was deep. There was a 10-foot palisade surrounding the town. But the Indians ascended that, that snow drift and climbed up to the edge of the palisade and dropped into town without warning. So they began attacking the houses, setting them on fire, bursting down doors, smashing windows, and rounding people up. There was no chance to put up a fight. Uh, there were some militiamen in town, and everyone living in town had their muskets, but they were caught totally by surprise. Um, in one example, John Williams wrote about this, and he said before he could do anything, they burst into Andrew's house with, with hideous acclamations and painted faces, and took him and his family captive. It was a very violent attack. Um, two of William's little children, one a six-week-old baby and another young child, were killed in front of Williams and had their heads smashed on the doorstep and were murdered in immediately. Uh, Williams owned a few slaves, which was not uncommon in New England. Uh, one, The slave woman Williams owned, named Parthena, uh, was murdered immediately by the Indians at the front doorstep. We suspect she was probably, probably trying to defend the two children who were being killed. They took Williams, the rest of his family, several children, his wife, Eunice, captive, and then rounded up a total of 112 people to take them on a forced march to Canada. During that march, um, 20 of them were killed along the way. Most likely to be killed were young children, pregnant women, or women who had just given birth. And so Williams had the job of not only dealing with his own personal losses, his entire congregation of survivors look to him to counsel them, give them strength to survive, and help them on their journey. When they got to Canada, they were some of them were kept there for 1,000 days. Uh, French Jesuit priests tried so hard to convert Williams to Catholicism. The war between Catholics and Puritans in early America was as intense as the war we might remember during the Cold War, between communism and Marxism and freedom in the West. It was that intense and that ideological. Uh, the French thought if they could convert Reverend Williams, who was the first minister captured, captured by the Indians, it would be a great religious triumph to get this man to turn against his faith. Williams wouldn't do it. And he, uh, he said, you know, you could give me everything in the world, but then what is, what's it worth? Because it cost me my own soul. Uh, they offered to free him early, free his children. But he wouldn't do it. He wouldn't, he wouldn't give up the faith, and he wouldn't cause his congregation to lose faith in the Puritan religion. So Williams and others spent up to a thousand days in captivity. They then were finally returned to Deerfield through negotiations. And then Williams wrote one of the great bestsellers in early New England history, The Redeemed Captive Returned to Zion. It's partly an action thriller but what happened during the attack, what happened during the march. And then it's also a theological book of argument between Puritanism and Catholicism. But he was celebrated as a great hero of the faith upon his return. And Williams lived for another 25 years after the, the massacre. I say massacre, that's what it's probably known as. It's come down in history as that, and that's why I titled the book that way. 
The people who lived through it never called it a massacre. None of the natives called it a massacre. The French didn't, the English didn't. Reverend Williams didn't call it that in his own book. It was not until 100 years later, in 1804, for the 100th anniversary of the raid, that the minister of the town used the word massacre several times and called it a bloody massacre, blamed the Indians for their viciousness. They were absolutely vicious, but so were the colonists. Uh, the Indians scalped people at will, and the English offered scalp bounties for Indian men, women, and children, uh, depending on the age or sex of the child. Uh, some of the colonists wanted to buy savage wild dogs, giant mastiffs, to tear the Indians apart. So there was plenty of violence on both sides, and it was a very cruel time. So that was the first era of the Deerfield Massacre, the first century of the survivors. Uh, the great challenge Williams faced was that his seven-year-old daughter Eunice was captured by the Mohawks, and he could never get her back. Uh, he tried. He, he wasn't allowed to see her much, but her mother had been slain on the first night of the march. She was separated from her father. Two of her siblings had been killed in front of her, and her only adults present were Indians. And so, of course, she forgot to speak English. She was raised a Catholic. Uh, when she was seven in captivity, she said, Oh, Father, the priests are making me say my prayers in Latin now. Will this harm me? <laughs> she never came home. And in fact, strangely enough, Eunice Williams was the last living survivor of the Deerfield Massacre. She died at a very old age, but she never came home to Deerfield again. So that was the first era of, of, of the raid and its aftermath. Then it was captured by myth and memory, which is the second half of my book. Uh, Deerfield is, I think, the only town I know of that, that celebrates and commemorates its defeat. And uh, so Deerfield eventually uh, co-opted the massacre and turned it into a tourist attraction, the legend of the town. Uh, there's a great relic in town called the Old Indian Door, which survived the attack. And they could never break through that door. It, it exists today at the Pocumpe Valley Memorial Association Museum. It's cut with dozens of tomahawk and axe slices. And there's a hole in the door that was cut through when they thrust a musket barrel through, shot randomly, and killed a woman. And it, it it's, became celebrated as one of the holy relics of New England. The door represented the barrier between civilization and savagery between Puritanism and Catholicism. And so it became a really a holy relic of New England history. Then over time, uh, the myth of, of, of the event took over. Uh, there was a man named George Sheldon who became the official historian of Deerfield. And he wrote books about it, including a massive two-line history. Then he had protégés who went to Canada to research what happened to the captives. and. Uh, they did incredible research up there. And then Deerfield became a tourist town of an arts and crafts movement, uh, a toy shop, so uh, dolls of massacre victims and made souvenirs. And then uh, Deerfield had pageants that re reenacted the attack, reenacted things from King Philip's War or from the Deerfield Massacre itself. And then these, these pageants co-opted the native culture and the native story and showed the Indians somehow becoming servants to the whites and admiring white culture. And then in 1913, uh, Thomas Edison made a silent film about the Bloody Book Massacre, which preceded Deerfield Massacre. It was during King Philip's War. And they recreated the Deerfield Massacre for popular entertainment. And then later, Historic Deerfield was founded uh, by the Flint family benefactors who wanted to love history. Their motive in creating historic Deerfield, which is a wonderful by and long street of museums in today, their motive in creating recreating Deerfield was is a Cold War antidote to communism. And so it's so interesting to me that Deerfield was once involved in a conflict between religious faith and great fervor. And then later Deerfield was used to to helped the West in a conflict against communism and Marxism. And so it's so interesting how the tradition of Deerfield was transformed into another kind of bad warfare. And to this day, Deerfield lives on as a very 
except so much visited museum town. Uh, my favorite standalone museum in America is the Becomfort Valley Memorial Association, which was founded by George Sheldon in the 1870s. And inside, it's a monument to the triumph of the colonial mentality. There's a chamber that has the old Indian door. And in that chamber, there are dozens of marble cenotaphs uh, set in the wall. It looks like a room of tombs, but there are no bodies buried there. But these cenotaphs bear inscriptions. Very political, very, very provocative inscriptions. I'll give you one example. It refers to a girl named Mary Field. It said, Mary Field captured age two, became a savage, and married one. Then, of course, in more modern times, Deerfield has sought to invite natives to participate in this. And so, during the 300th anniversary, descendants of John Williams and Eunice Williams, who married into the, into the tribes, their very descendants came to Deerfield and participated in the enactments and visits. And so, the Native American view and the Indian view has now come to the fore, and Deerfield embraces that, that part of the story, too. And so, George Sheldon, in fact, when he was writing his history of Deerfield, would excavate Indian grains willy-nilly, uh, dig up their bones, not catalog them, disrespecting the graves. And, uh, and so, Deerfield has had an arc of the thrilling story of the attack and the the killings and the survival, the captivity, the march to Canada, and then the survivors, and then the men, and then the memories. And so Deerfield now has existed for 300 years, celebrating and commemorating and revising the history of what happened in 1704. And so that's a brief nutshell of what the book is about. So it's really about the past and the present and recreating the past and remembering what past people thought was what really happened. So Deerfield was really a laboratory of myth and memory from 1704 to the modern day. And so that's probably the summary of that I'll give of the book. And uh, I think I'd invite questions because I've, I've come to a lot of events here and I know I don't like it when an author talks for maybe more than 20 minutes or 25 minutes. <laughs> And so I'd be more interested in hearing questions or talking about the myths of New England or the witchcraft or the fears from the Native American perspective. And, and uh, I'll say this about the word massacre. Uh, I got some criticism about using that word. And a bookstore in New England canceled my appearance because they said I used the word massacre. And then they canceled the appearance because they said, I don't use the word indigenous peoples. I should have always used the phrase indigenous people, they said. Well, a friend of mine, Charles Blackwell, was the, chicken, was the Chickasaw ambassador to the United States. Some of the tribes uh, appoint official ambassadors to the United States under old treaties with the federal government. And Char Charles said, don't give me any of that, that um, white woke guilt of indigenous people or the Native Americans. He said, I'm a Chickasaw and I'm an Indian. And if you check with the the Museum of the American Indian. The preference now is either to use the tribal name, Chickasaw, Mohawk, Abenaki, whatever, or Indian. And so uh, my Indian friends have now told me that indigenous people and Native Americans is now falling out of favor. And uh, I mentioned to a friend of mine who's an Abenaki <coughs> Indian and a scholar of, of Deerfield and the massacre, and, and she said, Forget that. Forget that story. The only person who would say, who would want to ban you because of these terminologies, would, is a guilty, white, woke person <laughs> who doesn't understand Native culture or Indian culture. And so I'm glad that no one here at Politics and Prose told me I couldn't come because I used the word massacre. It's a loaded term, but I explain it and, and how it evolves over time and how the Indians and the English victims of it never called it a massacre. And so... Uh, I just wanted to say that about the terminology. If anyone had questions about my use of the word Indian, massacre, it's all explained in the book. And uh, so thank you for that. Uh, so I think I should invite questions now from, from the audience. Here's where the questions come from, over here. Because um, the, the microphone is here. Yes. Um, what did they call it before it was designated a massacre? 
They called it an attack. <coughs> they called it the attack, the raid. Uh, they actually called it the mischief, uh, <laughs> which to me is a very neutral term. Uh, they really called it the raid, the attack, the sack of Deerfield, and the mischief. Th those were the common terms that they were used. So I'm from Hudson, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. which is right outside of Worcester. Mm -hmm. By the way, where are you from? I'm from here. Originally uh, from Chicago, but I'm, in, I'm from D.C. Okay. Um, so talk a little bit about the background. First of all, why Deerfield? Um, second of all, where did the Indians come from? What, what was the, what's the, what's the found, founding story of Deerfield? Because 1704 or whenever, that's, it's, you know, that's late, but it's not 1620. It's not Bradford, you know, right. coming to the shore right. of, you know, this, this awful, horrible wilderness place. Um, and 300 is small, but it's not, in at that time, it's not insignificant. It's not just a settlement. Um, so why Deerfield? Where were the French and the Indians coming from? Um, and um, why did they, why, why did they pick, and which Indians was it? Well, it was the Hurons, the Mohawks, Iroquois of the Mountain, Abnaki, and some Pocumptoks. The Pocumptok tribe had once ruled the Connecticut River Valley in the area of Deerfield for thousands of years. But they were partly crushed uh, in warfare with, with rival tribes. But some Pocumptoks also participated in the trade. So it was Mohawk, Iroquois of the Mountain, Mohawk, uh, Abnaki, and uh, Huron. And they came, from, they came from Canada, about 300 miles north of Deerfield. Deerfield was was a late comer to settlements. Deerfield was founded. Uh, there was no Deerfield during the Pequot, Pequot War of the, uh, the 1730s. And Deerfield was founded shortly before King Philip's War of 1675. Okay. So it was a, 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 the later group of towns that was founded in the uh, late 1600s, mid, mid to late 1600s. Okay. So it was not one of the early pioneering towns. And... How was it? Take, was there was there a big fight to take a lot of land? Did they drive a lot of people away? They drove no natives off the land. The Pocumpecs were gone, having been crushed by the, the Hurons. <clears throat> and so, to, to to the white settlers, it looked like open territory. They also signed some treaties with Indians, but the native understanding of land ownership was quite different than the right. English understanding. The Indians thought of it as shared use, right. shared hunting rights, fishing rights, the right to return and, and live there. And the whites thought it meant owning the land to exclude the, the understanding of property rights of the Indians was quite different from the, from the English colonists. And what did they intend to do with or at Deerfield? Was this part of the campaign that they were moving on to themselves? Or was it just a raid? Well, it, it was a raid as part of this, this uh, Queen Anne's War. Uh, Deerfield was close, easily accessible, and the French wanted to make a statement to settlements in New England that were encroaching closer to Canada. Now, Canada was much closer than New York City to Deerfield. Of course. And so uh, they wanted to make a statement and accomplish their goal of, of killing some people, terrifying the English, taking captives to either adopt into the tribes or sell back to the English for ransom. So it was, it was really multiple motives of the, of the Canadians and the Jesuits and uh, the Indians. Thank you. Bruce, what a surprise. Hello, you here. Uh, good to see you. Um, so in the film The Searchers, which sounds similar to Indian Ray Tate family, uh, the John Wayne character goes off for Natalie Wood because he says he's going to kill her. Um, <coughs> what, I mean, it's a John Wayne movie. He learns in the end. What, what typically, how were the captives treated by the whites who did trek after them, try to find them? Or were they excommunicated? Were they welcomed back? Were they... How, oh, they, were, how they, were they, they, were, they were prized and welcomed back. Each captive who was willing to return was viewed as a triumph of the Puritan faith and of the, the English Aaron into the wilderness. So it's not spoiled by Indians? No, no. All. But you mentioned the searches. Yeah. John Williams was one of the pioneers of a new form of literature called the Indian Captivity Narrative. 
There are a few hundred of these books written by people who have been captured and were released or escaped. But, uh, Mary Rowlandson's narrative is, is one of the early classic examples of the genre. And so, uh, and at a certain point, there was a fear that people who converted to the Indian way were lost, and they lost their faith, lost their religion. And it was considered a great cultural loss to have someone convert to the Indian way. But they weren't scorned, they weren't hunted down, they didn't want to, the colonists didn't want to kill them, they, they wanted to rescue them from the forest and the darkness and the evil of what they thought were represented by the Indians. Uh, I mentioned the searchers in the book because many of the Indian themes were have been appropriated by white culture over 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 history. Uh, college names, trade names, products, toys, uh, advertising, uh, and I mentioned the, the searchers as an as example of, of that, and also drums along the Mohawk, pop culture no novels. I, I cite a pop culture book from the nineteen. 40s in, the, in my book, it has a lurid pop paperback cover, and it shows a blonde white woman with torn sleeves and hands bound. And two bare-chested Indians are watching her, and the, the, the title on the book says, w would she be tortured, killed, or forced to marry? And so this, this lurid theme of the dangerous Indians has been a common thing to the last couple hundred years of American history. And The Searchers is one example of it. Drums Along the Mohawk, the Henry Fonda film. And this, this pop culture uh, fiction is also part of that theme. There's a long tradition of appropriating Indian imagery and place names and, and uh, practices into white pop culture. And The Searchers is a good example of that. Did, did whites do the equivalent raid captive thing at, at the Indians? Well, the, there's there's another battle which should be called the massacre at Turner's Falls when colonists uh, uh, sage raid and killed another woman and children. You know, what do we, what do we call uh, Wounded Knee? Do, is it is the white say, is it the Battle of Wounded Knee or is it the Massacre of Wounded Knee? Custer, is it the Little Bighorn Massacre or is it the Battle of Little Bighorn? And so to the French and Indians, the attack on Deerfield was just another raid, just one of many on the New England frontier. But to Deerfield, it became an iconic founding myth of the town. I'm yeah. just curious, uh, based on my reading of your book and some other books, um, it, it seems my perspective is that the French were more adapted to building alliances with the Indians versus the English. I don't know if that's an outcome of trading versus farming, but just curious at your thoughts, and if that's true, but also why that was for certainly the 1700s. Well, the English had many strong native alliances, too, uh, which were more fully expressed during the so-called French and Indian War in the 1750s and 1760s, and certainly during the American Revolution. Uh, the English had their tribal allies, and the French had their tribal allies, and each had strong alliances. Uh, with, with the tribes. So I would, I would say it was pretty equal in terms of their, their influence and dealings with, with the tribes. Yes? Really good to see you, James. Thank I love you. The book. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to wrap my head around the concept of the morning raids. Mm -hmm. What is that about? Is that necessity? I need someone to help me hunt and feed myself or well that's part of it it's also the per 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 perpetuation of Indian culture uh, remember when the whites got here uh, they spread a lot of disease smallpox <laughs> other illnesses and, and the first encounters with the colonists were very deadly and dangerous to the tribes as were these battles too and so it was to help perpetuate Indian culture to add to the numbers of the tribe to raise people from a young age they weren't really interested in, in, in adopting adults into the tribe. It was mostly young boys and young girls. They were most susceptible to being converted. And think of it this way. Imagine if you're raised in a strict Puritan household and disciplined. Isn't it a little more attractive to, to live in the forest and hunt or fish or not have that kind of discipline, not have to read the prayers, not, not, not go to church twice, you know, twice a week? 
And so the, the great fear among the Puritans was that the Indian way of life would prove quite attractive to young people. So it was, it was multiple reasons. To replace people who died, who had gotten sick, or who died, people killed in battle, to increase the numbers of the tribes. And it was very easy to convert the youngest to the Indian ways. So those were some of the reasons they did it. Oh, now that you're here, make sure you say the hello to Cameron in the back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have a question. Um, you mentioned you you, um, you spent a summer there in Deerfield <coughs> College. Um, yes. So my question would be, um, how has your perception or the town's perception changed in those years in between? And um, what was the most surprising thing you discovered while researching uh, uh, this book, this new book? The biggest change is the, the welcoming, of, welcoming of Indian voices to the story. They were excluded for a long time. To George Sheldon, uh, he silenced them in, in history. Uh, a friend of mine, Marge Bruchak, uh, wrote a great article on George Sheldon's erasure of the Indian part of the story. Uh, he also erased from the story uh, Eastern European immigrants from Deerfield story. There, there was a big uh, influx of Polish immigrants, or Russian immigrants, to the Connecticut River Valley and especially Polish to Deerfield. And to George Sheldon and his image of the, the, the meaning of the, the colonies and, and the traditions and the colonial re revival movement, which I didn't get to today, but it's in the book, there was this resurgence of interest in colonial antiques, paintings, traditions, relics, artifacts, pageants. And that was really a reaction to uh, modernization of the industrial age, of immigration, and so that, that was clinging on to the, the, the myth of the origins of the country. And so uh, the biggest change is the resurgence and return of Indian voices and black voices. There are many blacks in Deerfield, too. And the PVMA, PVMA Museum has been a pioneer in inviting Indian participation and memories and, and scholarship uh, about blacks in Deerfield, Indians, and European immigrants. And so that's probably the biggest change I've noticed. Uh, if you look at the uh, cenotaphic walls at the PBMA Museum with all these carvings about traditions, slaughtered by the Indians, the savages, uh, there's been a, really a sea change in that. And by sea change, people often mistake the, the, the Shakespearean phrase, sea change is an instant overnight change. No, a sea change is actually a slow evolving change. And that's really been the case in Deerfield. Uh, so the Indian voices that were in silence. Once upon a time, years ago, people even wouldn't talk about the different, different tribes that were involved in the attack. But now, uh, Deerfield now invites people from the Mohawk tribe, Iroquois, Abnaki, and others to participate in the telling of this story. So if nobody else has any more questions, I'll ask two more. Um, one, did the uh, the Jesuits, did they convert the Indians? Did the Indians all become Catholic, or did they just stay? Well, ma many of them did. In fact, in 1710, and there's an illustration of the book of this, one of the so-called four Indian chiefs of America went to visit Queen Anne in England in 1710. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons they went to see her was to help the England's help in fighting Catholic attempts to convert Indians to Catholicism and to the Jesuit faith. And so uh, one of my favorite pictures in the book is of one of the four so-called Indian chiefs of America holding a war club, which was probably my favorite and deadliest weapon on, uh, weapon on the frontier, much more than the tomahawk or the axe. And, and the, the New England Indians were not so much bow and arrow tribes, there are more flintlock musket tribes and war club and tomahawk tribes. Interesting. And one other question. You mentioned half a dozen tribes in the, in the, the band that attacked um, Deerfield. And I just thought that was coming from eastern Massachusetts. That was odd. I mean, the, the, the pilgrims, uh, they, they fought one tribe at a t time. There, were, there was a tribe in each. Did the French sort of gather them together and organize them? Or did they organize themselves like the Six Nations in upstate New York, or what? Well, there are several villages and forts in Canada of various tribes. And they had their own regions of mm -hmm. New France where they lived. <laughs> they didn't recruit a lot of them to come from 
America or the, the colonies. Right. Most of them were living in Canada and had their homes and forts and camps in Canada. And the French would just use diplomats and meetings and, and trade to recruit various tribes to help them. Uh, the governor of, of New France said it was his key mission to turn the tribes against the English and recruit mm -hmm. them to join their war against the English. And essentially organize them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Interesting. And around the raid, there were about 300 Indians and probably 50 French. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you.